Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. I'm your host, Doug Sharp. Your co-host, Rich Gear here as well. And one of my favorite people, Kirby Riles, is here. Um, Kirby, tell us a little bit about, I've been on the show before, but kind of reintroduce our audience a little bit to things that, you know, things you've done and things, who you are and that kind of stuff, because I think it, it's fascinating to me. I call him my apostle friend, so just, just to build him up a little bit here. He's, he's been all over, the, all over the world, I mean, doing things, but well, talk a little bit about that. Well, your travels, you'll soon be up to us in terms of travels, but we lived 14 years in Russia and nine years in Belgium when you're in Switzerland with missionaries. And, mm -hmm. uh, I had the privilege of being in uh, countries that were uh, very much steeped into evolutionary theory and uh, supposedly atheism, but I found really, truly very few atheists in Russia. After 70 years of a government-induced uh, anti-religion campaign, there really were I don't know if I met a real atheist in all my time in Russia. Oh, is that now, right? What do you do define as a real atheist? Well, oh, boy, someone who is absolutely convinced that there's no God and uh, and, has, yeah. and is ready to defend that. The Russians could not defend it. I thought that it would have had plenty of time to develop a good um, set of arguments for atheism, but they didn't. They really didn't. You had, interestingly enough, seemed to me you had some more difficult times even in Belgium yes. than you did. You know, we here in the West, we think, well, Russia, man, communism for 75 years and be steeped in that. And, and but uh, I, it's almost the, the countries that have been the seat of the Reformation or part of the Reformation, uh, they are harder of heart than, than, uh, than the supposed atheistic countries uh, were in, in a lot of respects. Well, in, in Belgium, with all, I love Belgium. I love Belgium, the Belgian people. But yeah. they actually have atheist churches there. I've mentioned that I think once before. Wow, we yeah. visited mm -hmm. one, and and uh, the government pays for that. They pay. Was that right? They pay for the building. They pay for the quote unquote atheist ministers, and for people to say that atheism is not a religion. Yeah. I mean, this is paid out of the religion funds. Mm -hmm. the, the government supports all the religions, so wow. atheism is just another religion. In which, in my opinion, no offense to our friends who are atheists watching, but it is, I think. It, well, it's a faith. It's a faith statement. It has to be. Yeah. So anyway, so you you being over there as a missionary in these in these various countries, you ran into a lot of atheistic uh, uh, tendencies, or at least agnostic, if you want to put those people who want to hedge their bets a little bit. Which, mm -hmm. by and large, most people who don't want to live for God, basically would say they're agnostic, that God's out there somewhere, but he doesn't really affect or influence their life much, okay? Right. But a lot of the things Doug and I have found over the years, evolution has been a big, a big part, a big component in that justification or in that self-satisfaction that we can go well, pretend like there is no basically, God. Basically, they, they don't believe in God, but that's because they don't like him. Yeah, that's yeah, right. That's, <laughs> they don't like the rules. God you know, does not a, exist, and I hate him. Yeah, that's right. That, that, yeah. That's, that's the whole yeah. deal. And so, um, t tonight we're going to uh, talk a little bit about the Cambrian explosion, and that's going to be a little bit about uh, the uh, foundational geologic column uh, that uh, is um, uh, sort of the underpinnings of evolution. And I find it very interesting that if you uh, scale it uh, satisfactorily on a timeline, you, you will see that it's almost 75% Precambrian. Uh, and uh, then, then come, and that's where before the time that life exists. And then in, in the biblical sense, the Precambrian would be uh, most likely a pre-flood uh, uh, sediments or uh, your base or rock, or base rock. Yeah. yeah, the the, the it salts, would be the granites, what? base all granites and all all that sort of thing. The volcanic stuff that makes up the you know, anything that doesn't have any fossils in it. And so, uh, seventy-five to eighty percent of the whole column is uh, is this the stuff without fossils? Yeah, death basically. And then well, it's, and not, it's just not it's, it's not life. Yeah, it's before yeah. life right. happened, you know, it's not death yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no life. yeah pre flood. Pre flood, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the, I was struck. Everybody watching this has seen the Big Bang show, and they know about physics. And I know there's some, some debate among creationism and intelligent science about the Big Bang. But the whole only point I want to make about this is it has to do with the Cambrian explosion mm. is that you had suddenly a big a, a instantaneous practically creation of matter. The universe just came from the singularity, which is supposedly smaller enough you, smaller than you could see. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, boom, the universe is created. Yes, sir, yeah. That's the biblical model. That's God right. spoke and it was. Sudden appearance of the universe. And, of course, science didn't agree with that. They believed in the steady-state theory, Sir Fred Hoyle's theory, 
uh, looked the at the theory about the yeah the universe has always existed. Well, yep. science has since said, "Sorry, Sir Fred, the Bible's right. If there wasn't anything, then there was." And now we see the same thing with, the, with life, the Cambrian explosion. Mm -hmm. There was like nothing, and suddenly, boom, all this life. And as I mentioned earlier to you guys before the show started, Charles Darwin had, didn't have an explanation for that. And I'm going to read this quote from Charles Darwin from The Origin of Species. Um, he said, to the question why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these earlier periods uh, prior to the Cambrian system, I can give no satisfactory answer. Okay, okay, that, you wrote that, what, how many, 150 years ago? Approximately, yeah, yeah there okay. yeah. So let's look at a more modern scientist, what he thinks about this weird appearance of life just out of nothing. Stephen Jay Gould wrote a popular 1989 book called Wonderful Life, look that up, and uh, he and another author both came up with the same conclusion, which is this from Wikipedia, look it up. They proposed that all modern animal phyla had appeared almost simultaneously. It sure sounds Cambrian. like the biblical model to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's in the Cambrian. Yeah. Which, yeah. This, well, just boom, life exists. And they can't explain it. They've tried various scenarios. There is no standard accepted scenario for why suddenly all this life appeared. Fully formed creatures. Now Darwin, when he talked about the missing fossil record, he was really referring to this. He was waiting for some transitional fossils to show up to explain why suddenly these fully formed creatures showed up. So he's, even, he's even talking about that even where you do have fossils, mm -hmm. there's like these breaks in the, the, the quote missing right. links yes. are not, they're still missing. Yeah. Every time they find, they find what they think is a missing link, they end up creating five more missing links is what happens yeah. because it doesn't fit together. I'm being a little bit glib here, but I'm saying that is the scenario. But it's interesting you talk about the, the, the Big Bang and the jump of the Cambrian explosion. I, I, I can even look, look, lower down when my, my son was taking a class in Western civilization. Mm -hmm. They didn't call it that. That's so called. Yeah. So called. But you have one chapter dealing with all the supposed ape men. Mm -hmm. And then everything else is from the Mesopotamian Valley onward. I mean, it's like suddenly, it's, like, that's it's the middle. a big jump. There's a big jump. There's all, they, 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 they have nothing for, in the Precambrian for, for, for hundreds of millions of years, billions of years, mm -hmm. okay? And then suddenly you have the, a big blink. That, or you have the Big Bang, and then you have, then you have nothing in the, in, in the world, and then you have nothing in civilization. I'm just sitting there going, it's interesting, all these big leaps, are, there's all these huge gaps. And that's kind of a real, but it's all about timing. They bait and switch you, in a sense, because this one is like, you know, 4.6 billion to 500 million. Okay, the Big Bang is 13 and a half, or 12 to 13 and a half billion years. So there's this gap between that and, and suddenly, and then you have this gap between that, and then you have a gap even when you talk about Western civilization. It's like there's all these gaps. Yeah, you got to find out. You know, I hate I, gaps. For those who are watching this, who are, are thinking that, um, boy, you know, science is really not supporting the Bible. I'm, I, au contraire, science repeatedly comes back and says, well, you know, the Bible is right. And, uh, well, well it's, the things, it's the science, uh, the, the the evidence, the facts that, that you dig up. Yes. And now it's a little bit different uh, with the, the theories behind it, the, the, the stories that they spin about the facts. That's a little bit uh, different. But, uh, well, but getting, what? Yeah, getting back to the, the, whole, the um, Cambrian explosion, right. you know, okay. how does this happen so quickly? Um, you know, evolution has to have millions of years because of the changes, the mutations have to be very <coughs> tiny for it to continue in the um, gene pool. Otherwise, if there's a major change to an animal, let's say a lion gives birth to a, a donkey, yeah. well, a donkey's not gonna survive. Yeah, that, <laughs> you know, that's kind of the Goldschmidt theory, the hopeful monster theory, the and, hopeful Gould, monster and theory. Gould updates it with what's called punctuated equilibrium. Yes, punctuated. Same kind of thing, yeah, but well, it's, 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 it's a faulty, it's a It's basically because we have no evidence for transitionary fossils, mm -hmm. so they, they, they go, if they get isolated gene pools, or pockets like this, yes. some, and they're ice, it's something, something. Yeah, the happens. punctuated equilibrium idea is sort of a rescue mechanism it is for a rescue the evidence that, that, that isn't there. It's the how only scientific theory that shows yeah. it's promoted because of lack of evidence. 
Yes. If you think about it's because it, so. they're stuck. They're stuck. They have to come up with something because the whole thing of this gradual development of all these species is completely destroyed by the Cambrian explosion, mm -hmm. for which they have no good explanation. So they come up with these things called punctuated equilibrium, which requires hopeful monsters, which is the most ridiculous idea. And for you know, you have to have two of them. Things. You gotta have yeah, two. No, yeah, 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 two. Have two. But I want to explain what we mean by hopeful monsters. Let's say that um, an elephant gives birth to a zebra. Okay. okay, so that's a major mutation, right? I mean, total system change. We're being a little crazy here, little but that's, crazy. you know. So Mrs. Elephant, point. Mama Elephant, she has a baby zebra. Now, he's going to have all sorts of problems getting along with the other elephants and everything. But, guess what? He, there's no other elephant's going to look at him twice. He's too short. <laughs> he's not good looking. Doesn't yep. have any tusks. He's got weird stripes so on his body. He's got weird stripes. So, when Mrs. Elephant gives birth by a mutation to a male elephant, um, zebra, he's going to need somewhere another hopeful monster another female zebra at the same time it has to be the same place by the way the same issue happens even if you try to do it with gradual evolution exactly yeah. it's the same problem I've, I've said this for years how how do you get what do you if you believe in the the ape-like hominids you know the the oscillopithecines and the uh, homo habilis uh, mm. to homo erectus to all the rest uh, but you have to get them all at the same you have to have a male and a female at the same time yeah. But on top of that, Doug, and you know this, how we should have been extinct 300 times over if all of those things happen. And human beings are three and a half million years old. The no, genetic no. load would kill you off if you have two people inbreeding yes. like that. The now, harmful mutations uh, far, far outweigh uh, uh, anything yeah. that's beneficial. And usually if you have something that's quote unquote beneficial, you pay for it elsewhere. Yes. You know, there was this movie a few years ago about this bad water and Julia, uh, I forgot the actress, but this, they poisoned this water and this one company didn't want to pay for it. And so the lawyers for the utility company that poisoned the water met with the lawyers for the people suing. And um, they sat down at this table. This all has to do with mu mutation and Cambrian explosion. So they sat down at the table, and uh, the people def trying to sue them for the bad water, they said, yeah, we're going to discuss this water problem. And uh, would you like something to drink? And they, and they said, sure, they're pouring this water. And they said, by the way, that came right from the water taps. Yeah. And they put the glass down and didn't touch it. So they're saying the water's safe, but they won't drink it. So uh, this has to do with mutations. If mm -hmm. mutations are such a good thing, I'm waiting for one pro-evolutionary scientist to stand up and say, yeah, I'd like to be mutated. Why don't you guys give me some things that will cause well, you, mutations? He dug it to sort of the same thing. You know, well, who, are you going to be the one volunteering for, this is not mutation, but it's about surgery to make yourself a better creation. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's make my eyes so they don't see upside down, or let's, let's take, are you going to be the one to volunteer for that, you know? And, uh, but then, well, they're, they're saying basically by the fact they're refusing any type of mutation, they're absolutely that's opposed true. to it, because they know that 99% of the time it's very negative. But here's the thing, you know, you just can't, they, 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 they want, if, they, if, they, if you want to turn it back and say, well, you believe that from two people everything came, I say, yeah, but the two people I had were created by God. I do have the God component. I and mean, this is not begging the question. They were created perfect in his very image. Hey, and look, even after they fell, they lived 900 years. Let okay? me just say that even you know? evolutionists believe every man and every woman descended from one woman, one man. Just like the Bible says, mitochondrial Eve. Uh, yeah. uh, yes, uh, mitochondrial yeah, Eve. Which is it's itself. all already been proven. And so again, science, against its will, is coming around to the biblical view. Well, yes, there was a Big Bang, like the Bible said. Oh, well, yes, there was a Cambrian explosion, like the Bible says. Well, yes, every man and every woman is descended from one man and one woman, just like the Bible says. Again and again, science against its will is being used to confirm. The real issue, the real issue is all about <coughs> dating and all about timing. Yeah, exactly. Like millions of years. This is why we fight this so much, because obviously from our perspective, if you have dying and, and disease and suffering before the fall of man, then you've negated the work of Jesus Christ. People yes. say, well, what does that mean? Because Jesus came to undo the effect of the curse, which included physical as well as spiritual death. He covered the animals, the plants, as well as humans. Jesus had to die physically, not just spiritually. He had that all these things are covered. Paul says, from man came death. Evolution requires that from death came man. Okay? Mm -hmm. And long age evolutionists, this is what you have to deal with. If you have death and dying and suffering before 
<coughs> Adam and Eve fell. You've got a real problem with the biblical record. Okay? And you're using extra biblical sources. So Kirby is using, we're using their own scenarios. We okay. recognize and we don't accept the long age time periods that they're talking about. But the, po the, the actual point of it, the idea that things came out of nothing, many, you know, the universe out of nothing, life out of nothing, you know, man out of nothing. You know, this is kind of where we, we keep getting into this stuff all the time. Yeah. Uh, they always do support what the biblical record, I even tell people, I says, if you look at it, even the, 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 the uh, they've come around the fact there's, a, there's probably one supercontinent. Well, the biblical thing seems to indicate the same exact thing. Mm. There was one supercontinent. It broke up during the time of the Great Flood. You know, you know? Well, we know, according to science, that there's been some major catastrophic changes in the Earth's climate. The ice ages, which followed uh, the development of all the species, which is, fits the biblical model. But uh, this uh, uh, all yeah. comes... Go ahead. Well, uh, you would have the ice age being a post-flood event. Right. Uh, and it would have been something that would have been weather related as the, the flood uh, and you have the sequence of the of the rock strata uh, which were laid down during the flood have different waves of the tidal uh, action taking place over the periods of the uh, right. of the deposition of the, uh, of the flood separation of the continents causing all the all the sediment to be roiled up right. uh, and uh, the dating uh, of sedimentary rock is done by the sequence of fossils. Yeah. And so no matter, and there's a law of superposition that uh, dictates, you know, uh, the top layer is always younger than the bottom layer. You know, that's really what you need that's, to that's show. That's their argument. Yes. That's their argument. And so uh, the layers on top uh, they sort of show a, a, a general progression of mm -hmm. uh, of complexity as you go uh, to go more towards the top. Of course, as we said before, and John Morris has said it, 95% of the fossils are what are they, Doug? They're clams. Clams. <laughs> really? So then 95% of the, the other 5% are fish. Yeah. And so, uh, really, you see that all throughout the fossil record from bottom to top. And fish, so, fish throughout the whole thing, clams. It fits perfectly yeah. with a yeah. flood model. Yeah. And so then uh, what we would uh, then look at is the, these things that they call index fossils. And basically, if you find them there, well, no matter where they are in the superposition, well, that identifies the, the error that you're uh, looking Again, that's at. There. It's a nice theory, yeah. this doesn't work. And, uh, and uh, then uh, if you're going to use radioisotopes to date these things, uh, you can't do it with sedimentary rock. And that's the reason, because this all comes from really different, the really deposited from everything else. And so, uh, you know, then, then you find uh, uh, volcanoes that erupt and, uh, in recent times, and you uh, use radioisotope dating to f find out how old those are. Well, uh, it doesn't date to the date of the eruption, which is known in history. It dates to millions of years. Yes. Well, then they say, well, what you're getting is old material coming up in the magma that's being spread out. Spit then out. why is that not the truth for all the other ones you're dating? Exactly. Then that, yeah. uh, that really is a, 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 a bad thing for the evolutionists because if that, uh, you know, that works against the, their theory, uh, then how, why don't we uh, see that in, in anything else that's deposited that way? So really what the, the you're getting with uh, is radioisotope dating is meaningless unless you're using carbon-14. Yeah, that's the, pretty Carbon-14 uh, is actually something that helps us uh, creationists because if you look at the carbon-14 dating, is that it has a short half-life, uh, 5,730 uh, years if you uh, uh, take the assumptions of it uh, to its uh, logical conclusion. But the, the, one of the assumptions of it is that the production of carbon-14 in the atmosphere from nitrogen, uh, from co cosmic rays, mm -hmm. Uh, that's the assumption of it is that that uh, process was in equilibrium because it's been millions of years. But it isn't in the equilibrium. They've, know, they've known that for years also, but they don't tell you that. Oh, that's interesting. And so, the, uh, so you have uh, carbon-14 being found in diamonds, carbon-14 found in limestone, in uh, coal, uh, measurable amounts 
uh, dating it young, and yet uh, they don't think to look for it because well, are you, aren't they even finding it in unfossilized bones? Are, are they right? So uh, carbon fourteen and dinosaur bones right. that have been unfossilized. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, if you find the dinosaurs are 65 million years old, no matter if they're on top or on the bottom. Yeah, that's the last. That's the last part. Right. You know, they triceratops are the latest ones. It, yeah, you don't you know? uh, uh, find people doing uh, drill cores to go down into the um, Cretaceous uh, rocks in Michigan. Uh, well, there are. I don't think there are any. But uh, I don't think uh, there are either. But uh, yeah. uh, go down to to, to find dinosaur bones. Uh, uh, you know, if you're going to dig up dinosaur bones, you go out to uh, Glendive, Montana, where you can dig them up there on the surface. Yes. They're in the forest and the formation out yeah. west, and so uh, you look for them on the surface, and so they're buried on the surface in in rock layers, so, uh, in the shallow rock, rock layers. And, but the, by definition, uh, they're they're Cambrian. Uh, they're, I mean, they're Cretaceous yeah. or Jurassic or whatever. There's, yeah. there's so many things here that, that point to the biblical model. And I'm, I've often been struck by the fact that human history, mm -hmm. you take it back to everything we've written down, what we know about human history, goes back about 6,000 years and, that's and it stops. Yeah, it and does. it just stops. There's no more history after that. Okay, what about archaeology? Let's go, go to the, the most ancient archaeological discoveries. About 6,000 years, That's what I was saying earlier. You, you can debate yep. on some of those dates, but we're not talking millions of years, we're talking about the biblical yeah, model, the, the pyramids, it's just a very short time, and it just stops. What happened before that? The Bible says that's when God created the earth. So I think the, the history, the archaeology, the science all support the Bible. And those watching this tonight, I know uh, I speak for Rich and Doug, and I'd say that don't ever let anyone tell you that science disproves the Bible. It's the other way around. This, the Bible is confirmed by science, and, and we shouldn't be in any way intimidated. A lot of people I know like to just give you this arrogant type view, like you're really stupid if you don't. Oh yeah, or they say things like, "Don't let them." Bible's do not that. a science textbook. Oh, I, says, I hear that. I said that doesn't matter. It, when it touches on things that science touches on, it's accurate. It's accurate. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the thing. <clears throat> And so uh, I, I think that it's um, imperative that we uh, take a look at, at the, what that geological column says and uh, analyze it according to uh, a, a different timeline. Uh, we can uh, compare the timeline of, uh, of the evolution versus the timeline of creation. And uh, you can take a look at uh, uh, everything pre-Cambrian, which is the majority of the, of the fossil record. Which is not uh, much in it. There's uh, not uh, not any uh, anything in it. Then you have the Cambrian, which would be like the f earliest stages of, of the of the flood, you know, where you have mostly marine uh, fossils and uh, and certain uh, f like extinct uh, creatures that uh, <coughs> didn't survive. Yeah, like brachiopods and, and uh, formiferae right. and things like that. Yep. And th then you would have uh, a little bit later. You would have. Uh, the amphibians. You also have to take into account plant evolution. When I, uh, when we look at plants, the evolutionists really don't uh, do much with plants. They, they like, uh, there isn't really much in plants that uh, interests them, apparently. Well, uh, they say some things, but it's just, uh, yeah, it's almost like a form thing, you know? But you have to understand that the, the food, the plants uh, that uh, uh, the creatures uh, work with, there's uh, interrelationships with uh, the creatures that uh, are, are eating them. And so if you don't have one, you don't have the other. And so you have to explain uh, those, that whole, those whole environments uh, you know, working together, uh, and so it makes more sense that uh, there is a sorting mechanism that occurred during the flood. So the, you and, uh, generally have the right order, right? Right, you yeah, generally but have the, but the it, same with order. With exceptions, major order. exceptions, but yes. anyway. So. Yeah, if, if you go out to Las Vegas, uh, this is my favorite example, is uh, there's a, a, a couple of parks you can go out there, and you can actually see the uh, the, the rocks they have, they have the Jurassic, Triassic, and Permian rocks uh, underneath the Cambrian rock. The Cambrian uh, is on top. Yeah, see, I don't mm. think they know what that means. If you could explain, because we want this to be a very, very simple That's right. viewer that never understand. Could you explain what you mean by these different? Okay, the Cambrian uh, is uh, the next layer up. 
after Precambrian, which is uh, the, all the, the, the non life. The earliest, That's according the, to evolutionary theory, is the earliest life. The 500 million earliest, to the earliest life of yeah, the It's the oldest life. Yeah. Yeah. And so then uh, you, you skip about the three or four different ages. Silurian, Mississippi. And then you have uh, Permian, uh, Triassic, and Jurassic, and, and the next sequence is up. And so in this particular case, you have to explain. Well, how this Cambrian uh, layer got moved over on how top? How is it that the oldest layer is on top of the? And this is a, not a small. And, and so this bit. is uh, so the sequence is on top Cambrian, the Jurassic, Triassic, Permian. And if you go 75 miles to the north and east uh, from Las Vegas, there's a another park called Valley of Fire, and there the sequence is Cambrian on top, Jurassic, Triassic, Permian. The Muddy Mountains is the Cambrian. Jurassic, Triassic, Permian is underneath. The, uh, the Jurassic is a red rock. It's very distinct. If you go out there, you can actually uh, see it uh, very uh, distinctly. And there's a place uh, where you drive into Red Rock Canyon and uh, called Calico Basin. And you can uh, look into the, uh, the, the Turtle Head Mountain is up on the top Cambrian. And underneath it, you see the sharp uh, line where the Jurassic is underneath it. And, and so to uh, explain this and to explain it in two different places, it, you know, this makes sense that the same event created both the uh, scenarios. Yes, yeah. But in the middle of them is another mountain called Frenchman Mountain, so just a little west of Mount, okay. and, so, uh, and it's Precambrian. It's sitting there uh, as part of the Vishnu Schist. Uh, part you're, of the you're Grand going Canyon. to the, the Grand Canyon in June. Yeah, we're going to try to go into the Grand Canyon in June, and we're going to probably see a lot of the different things. You know, there, there's a spot in the Grand Canyon where the, it goes to Mississippian, uh, what is it, Mississippian to the Cambrian, uh, Mississippian, Cambrian, Mississippian. Oh, yeah, and it's interbedded, right? Interbedded. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I love the Grand Canyon because you have some of these um, sedimentary layers of very, very old rocks that are completely bent, not mm -hmm. fractured, completely bent. How can you take rock that's been laid down supposedly millions of years apart and bend it all perfectly symmetrically together without fracture? Yeah. And, I mean, of course, if it was in a soft state and malleable and was formed right from the flood. So anyway, this is uh, some of the fun, fun stuff that we, we try to figure out. We don't have all the answers, let's put it that way, but I'll, I'll tell you that uh, it's, it's, uh, it would be, behoove you to uh, uh, check out you know, the creationist explanations for how uh, for the uh, for the rocks. Yeah, we didn't even get into the ice age. We we're going to get into that. We'll have to have you back, Kirby. We have to have you back. We'll talk about that next time. But because uh, it's uh, that's fascinating as well, and that has become a friend of the creationist, the ice age. We've talked about it on our show a few times. Yeah, which you know, really uh, is something that is a weather uh, event that happened after after the flood. Right. Yeah. Well, we hope you enjoyed our time on Revolution Against Evolution. We'll see you next time.